we continue our study in a book of the Bible called James. If you've got a Bible, go to James chapter five. Next week will be the very last sermon. So we're nearing the end. And James is Jesus' kid, little brother, grew up going to homeschool and sleeping in a bunk bed with his big brother, who happens to be our Lord and Savior. And so James is a blue collar guy, and we like to call him the blue collar scholar of the New Testament. He's super practical. How do you take faith and not just have it live on paper? ages in theory, but live in life practically and daily. And today's topic is how does faith work when you are suffering? So how many of you are suffering? You can all raise your hands. Oh, and if you're not suffering, just give it a minute. And if you're not suffering, you love someone who is, so you're suffering with them. And any, anything that doesn't prepare you for reality in life is not that helpful. And the Bible is the most honest book that's ever written. And it talks about the pains, problems, and perils in our fallen world and how when we suffer, our faith needs to activate so that we can endure it. So it's that time of year. We're coming to the end of 2021. Thank you, Lord. Uh, the, the best thing about 2021 is it ends. That's the best thing about 2021. And this is the time of the year that uh, many of us are reflective. And we look back on the year and ask, okay, what did I learn? What did God do? How do I need to change? And what does God intend for me next year? So I've been having these conversations with my wife, Grace, and with the Lord. Every week I take a prayer hike in the mountains and I just verbal process with the Lord. And I like to walk around the neighborhood and hold my wife, Grace's hand and just talk and verbal process with her. And I've shared with you uh, in the past, um, a really significant moment in my life. I was driving around in a truck with uh, Pastor Rick Warren, not to name drop, and that's what you do when you name drop, you say not to name drop. So I was driving around with Pastor Rick Warren and, uh, and he said that he had previously viewed seasons of life as sort of a good season and then a bad season. If you just get through the bad season, then you get on to the good season. And he said, the longer he'd lived, he'd come to the realization that really life is like train tracks. And I've used this analogy a lot. And this is gonna be a real heartfelt, honest sermon. And if it's too personal, I won't put it on the internet. So just pray for me as we go. Nonetheless, Pastor Rick said, he's now learned that, uh, that life is two train tracks. There's always good and bad. There's blessing and cursing. There's wins and losses. There's joys and tears continually in life. And the older I get, the more I think that's absolutely 100% incontrovertibly true. And I was looking back on this year, this is one of the worst years of my whole life and one of the best years of my whole life. Uh, 2014 was one of my worst years. 2021 uh, was one of my worst years. And 2007 were one of my worst years. The Bible has this thing called the year of Jubilee where every seven years is supposed to be awesome. I, I don't know where you get that. If you know where to, if you have the QR code, please send that to me. I would like to, I would like to get the year of Jubilee. I have not seen it. Every seven years are horrible. Just so you know, 2028, I'm not gonna be here. I'm just taking it off. I've already put in my reservation. And this being one of the hardest years of my life, um, it's just sort of culminated with, um, with looking back on the year, seeing the worst of the worst and the best of the best. And I don't know if that's been your experience as well. Um, that being said, um, James talks about in chapter three, he talks about blessing and cursing. And he puts blessing and cursing side by side. Let me say this, blessing is from God, cursing is from Satan. Uh, you can look at your past and put grace on it or condemnation on it, blessing or cursing. You could look at your present and put hope on it or hopelessness on it, blessing or cursing. You can look at the future and put faith on it or fear on it, blessing or cursing. And, and, and what I have felt over the course of this year were moments and days where I felt absolutely blessed of God, richly, inexpressibly blessed of God and other moments where I felt cursed where I felt like oppression was on me and my family, and I wasn't sure how to proceed forward. And in these moments of suffering, when life hits, and as Christians, we don't love suffering, we don't seek suffering, we don't pray for suffering, but when it comes, we need to know what to do with it because ultimately it does come. And I just wanna say personally, uh, I'm sorry for all the suffering that you've been through this year. I'm sorry for the suffering that those you love have been through, family and friends. 
I know that suffering comes in many shapes and sizes. For some of you, it's emotional, physical, spiritual, mental, marital, parental, relational. And for some of you, it's multi-categorical. It feels like complex grief or an avalanche where you're getting hit with so many things simultaneously that it's a bit overwhelming. The question is, where is God when that happens? And how do we find God? And, and what is God's plan for us? And oftentimes, I think there are well-meaning pastors who get up and tell their people how to get around suffering. And let me say this, if you can get around it, please do. But there are times that you can't get around suffering, you need to go through it. I'm just gonna be honest with you. Uh, my job is to be honest with you. And, and, and ultimately what I wanna to do today is I want you to not just look at your suffering and it may be something that you've been through that you're currently processing. It may be something that you're in the midst of right now and maybe something that you foresee on the horizon and it's coming and it causes you some anxiety or consternation. I don't want you to just look at it. My hope, prayer and goal today is through the lens of James chapter five, that you would look through it, that you would not ignore it but you would not allow it to become the only thing on your horizon that you would look through it to the purposes of God and how he will use it for his glory and your good. And so he starts with two encouragements to extend our view and to look through our suffering into God's eternal purposes for it. And the first is that God's harvest is coming. James 5, seven and eight, B, what's the word? Do you like that word? Does anyone like that word? I don't, I yell at the microwave. I think that the speed limit is a good recommendation for people who are slow. I do, I do, I do. I like, I like my favorite things are fast, faster and fastest. Those are my favorite three things. I am not patient. Be patient therefore brothers until the coming of the Lord. Until Jesus comes back, be patient. He wrote this 2000 years ago, that's a lot of patience. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be, it's like he's got a theme or something, it's crazy. You know why he keeps telling us to be patient? Because we keep forgetting to be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. The first thing he says is that human history is like the harvest time for a farmer. Now, uh, years ago, when our kids were little, one of our favorite places to go on vacation was in the midst of uh, apple orchards. If you've ever eaten an apple, it probably came from this neighborhood. And the thing you learn with farming is there's nothing you can do to hasten the process. It doesn't matter if it's apples, pears, or cherries. Let me ask you this, if a tree is going to grow the fruit, if you yell at the tree, does it produce fruit faster? No, I've tried. If you manipulate the tree by weeping and throwing a fit or seeking to bribe the tree, does it produce fruit faster? No, it doesn't. What about if you um, just beg the tree, just with all you got, just, just invoke total begging toward the tree? Do you get fruit faster? What causes a tree to produce fruit faster? Nothing. It just has its own season and cycle. It has its own rhythm and pattern. There's nothing you can do about it. You just have to wait. What he's saying is that your life, God intends for it to be fruitful. The Bible uses this language a lot, which means you're just gonna need to be patient with the process that the farmer has to create fruitfulness in you. And God looks at human history and he sees all of our planet like a farmer would see a field. And what he's saying is God's going to harvest when it's time, but until Jesus comes back, it's not yet time. Now, what happens is as soon as we become a Christian, we want Jesus to come back immediately. True? You're like, I'm saved, are we done yet? Because all of <laughs> everything I care about seems to be buttoned up right now. I'm not kindling, we're, we're good, right? The Bible says elsewhere that God is not slow, but he is patient, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to eternal life. What that means is Jesus will come back when he saved everybody he intends to save, when he's done everything he's intended to do, and he's taught everything he intends to teach. And the point is, if he's not come back yet, that must mean that his work is not done yet. And sometimes we get so um, consumed in our own suffering that we forget that he's helping a lot of people and he's doing a lot of things. And sometimes it's like, Jesus, could you just come back today? I can't handle any more. 
And what he would say is, I love you with all my heart, but there are other people going through it too. And I'm trying to take care of everybody. I mean, one of my great joys as a pastor, and it's one of my great pains as a pastor is I get a front row seat to people's lives. Uh, this week, I felt a demonic oppression over me that's been there for days. And Grace asked, what's going on? I said, I don't know. I just, I literally feel kind of cursed and oppressed. There's just a heaviness and a weightiness. Every single day this week, I have been up past midnight with a pastoral crisis. I can't tell you what the details are because these are people who, they deserve privacy, but people who were in some sort of suffering that was so intense that there wasn't another moment that they could go without being prayed for and cared for. Even last night I got home and I thought, okay, maybe tonight I get a night off. No, nope. here comes the shot to the soul. It was overwhelming and devastating. And there are days that if you're a believer and if you read the Bible and you believe in the kingdom of God and the resurrection of the dead and the wiping of all of our tears and the end to all misery and justice, evil and oppression and no more presidential elections and no more meetings of Senate or Congress and no more news reporters, you're like, come Lord Jesus, Maranatha, amen. Now, amen. Like if Jesus comes back right now, I'm fine with that. Like if I see him on the clouds, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna chuck my phone. That's what I'm doing, man. I'm like, <laughs> I'm done. Like everybody leave me alone. He's got it all taken care of going forward. If you know and love the Lord and if you have any foretaste of his kingdom and what he has planned for us, you just want him to come back as soon as possible. And I'm sorry for the suffering that you're going through, but he's gonna use that to cause you to grow in character. It says in Hebrews chapter two, verse 10, and I'm just gonna verbal process. This is not a sermon. This is, just a, this is just a bit of a chat. But the Holy Spirit brings to mind Hebrews 2, 10, where it says that Jesus was made perfect through his suffering. Now, Bible commentators will read that and their minds explode because before he suffered, Jesus was perfect. So how did he become perfected through his suffering? The answer is there are things that you know that you really know once you experience them. There's a theoretical knowledge and then there's an experiential knowledge. There's something that you've read in a book and there's something that you've tasted in life. This is why I think people who are getting engaged or adorable, they read marriage books and think they know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> parenting books too. Somebody's like, I'll figure it out, I read a parenting book. Oh, wait till you get a kid. That's a variable you have not yet factored in. <laughs> marriage, parenting, communism, it all works on paper. It's once you get the people involved. <laughs> It's a little more complicated. <laughs> the fruitfulness in your life that comes through suffering is there's going to be elements and aspects of your character that would be not yet as fruitful unless you went through the season of suffering. As you go through suffering, you're gonna appreciate that you have a God who came down to suffer with you and to suffer for you you can appreciate that there is a God who has a plan to end all human suffering. And you'll have compassion for those who are suffering and empathy to walk with them. And what he's saying here is that ultimately, as we look at human history, Jesus is working on our individual fruitfulness, but then he's also reaping the full harvest of all the people that he has predestined to salvation and chosen for eternal life. And until that number is complete, until that work is finished, he doesn't start the work of harvest. And so what he tells us repeatedly is in the meantime, we need to be patient. He says this over and over. Verse seven, be patient, being patient. Verse eight, be patient. Verse nine, patience. Verse 10, patience. And verse 11 of chapter five, steadfast and steadfastness, which is persevering in patience. Now what happens is if you have a functioning conscience, even if you don't know God, you look at this world and you come to the quick realization that something has gone terribly wrong. Something's wrong. Like, why are people dying? They're supposed to be living. Uh, why, why are we warring? Instead, we should be loving. Um, why are we attacking when we should be blessing? Uh, what has gone wrong in this world? And what this leads to is a series of potential answers that every human being needs to choose which is their answer. And the decision you make to this question, it's also called the problem or mystery of evil, determines ultimately how you will live, how you will interpret all the suffering that you go through and whether you waste it or invest it. 
And the truth is that human beings go through the same thing, but depending upon how we answer this question, it determines how we interpret our experience. And so just let me for a moment, when it comes to this issue of suffering and pain and evil and injustice on the earth, uh, there are a few different potential answers. And we'll look at them categorically and then we'll look at those emotionally and personally. But here they are category and he, categorically. And here's the question that really is behind James 5. If God is all powerful, which he is, and all knowing, which he is, and all good, which he is, we're talking about James' brother, Jesus. Why is there suffering and evil? The first option is, as you're suffering, you can come to the conclusion, well, there must be no God. If there is suffering, there must not be God. This is the conclusion of atheism. Atheism has an answer, but not a comfort. When you're suffering, an answer doesn't help, a comfort does. Well, there is no God. You come from no one, you're here for nothing, you're suffering for no reason, and there will be no consequence when it's over. The logical outgrowth of atheism in the seasons of suffering is suicide. You just reach the point where the pain is too great and so you end the life to end the pain. The second option is something called finite Godism and that is that God is not all powerful. This is a false teaching that some religions have that there is a God and he does know and he does love and he's just not powerful enough to do anything to rescue us, to save us, to deliver us, to lift the curse, to remove the suffering and to remedy the problem. Again, that's an answer, but it's not a comfort. It's an answer to say, well, God can't do what needs to be done, but it's not a comfort. In the, some, in the same way, if you go to the doctor and they're like, there's nothing I can do for you. That's an answer, but it's not a comfort. You call the police and you say a crime has been committed. And they say, well, we, we just don't do conflict. Um, <laughs> trying to reimagine the police force. You say, well, that's an answer, but that's not a comfort because what I need is someone who has the power to do something. The third option is that God is not all knowing. This is evolutionary Godism or a false teaching under the guise or auspices of Christianity called open theism or process theology. And that is that God doesn't know the future. He's just like us. Every day he wakes up to see what happens. Every day God's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened. Just like we're responding to things, God is responding to things. All this is, is this is taking our finite humanity, projecting it on God. And the problem with this, once again, is the Bible. The Bible is 25% prophetic in nature at the time of its writing, meaning God's telling us what's gonna happen. Well, that's a really odd thing for a God who doesn't know what's gonna happen. Let me tell you this, if God doesn't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, I'm not getting out of bed. I'm just not. Like if, if history is open and, and Satan and demons and evildoers have a plan for tomorrow and God doesn't, Again, it's an answer, but it's not a comfort. You need to know that God not only knows tomorrow, he knows every tomorrow. The, the other option is number four, that God is not all good, pantheism or panentheism. This is where all is God or God is all. This is the ideology of the radical green agenda. This is the agenda of Lion King, the circle of life. This is the ideology of Avatar and Star Wars, that God is good and evil. And as a result, when evil happens, it's because on that day, God decided to do evil and be evil. And when good happens, it's because on that day, God decided to do and be good. This is summarized and synthesized with that Eastern view of the yin and the yang in a circle that is black and white. And it is their way of saying that God is both good and evil. Again, that's an answer, but it's not a comfort. Because if you're suffering and you run to God, you may get God on his evil day. He may take your suffering and add to it rather than help through it. Another option is there is no suffering and evil. This is subjectivism or pluralism. This is there is no truth, there is no reality, there's just your interpretation or definition of it. Well, again, that may be an answer, but it's not a comfort. Uh, this is formalized in Buddhism where they would say that reality is an illusion. And you can believe that until you get hit by a car. And what happens with some people is they say, well, that's not evil, that's just their perspective or that's their preference. 
And what it does, it eradicates categories of good and evil, right and wrong, godly and demonic, suffering and blessing. And again, it may be an answer, but it's not a comfort. When someone is suffering and say, oh, you're not suffering, you're just looking at it wrong. Look on the bright side, find the, find the silver lining. That's not a comfort. That may be an answer, but it's not a comfort. And then lastly, God is not done yet, so patiently live by faith. The Bible says that there is a God. His name is Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is good. He's altogether good. In him, there is light. There is no darkness at all. It says that God knows the future. He says, I know the plans I have for you. He's got a plan for you. He knows the future. And he's all powerful. He can do whatever he wants. And calling him Lord, it is denoting his sovereign, unequaled, unprecedented, unparalleled power. The question is, well, if, 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 if he is that way, then why is life this way? Because he's not done yet. You know, Jesus was crucified, laid in the grave for three days. And during those days, if you walk by, you'd like, what is God doing? Well, he's not done yet. He's gonna get up. We're just in the time between the times. This is the time of waiting, not harvesting. This is the time of trusting, not harvesting. This is the time of worshiping, not harvesting. Again, be patient, being patient, be patient, patience, patience. I don't know if you see a theme. And what happens when the harvest comes, the farmer goes out, they harvest all the ripe fruit, and what do they do with the dead branches? They cut them off, they stack them for the burn pile. Every harvest, we see what will happen when Jesus returns. He will harvest all of the believers and he will burn in the flames of hell, all of those who do not belong to him. There is a day when the harvest comes to an end. There will be no evangelism. There will be no missions. There will be no church planting when Jesus returns. All there will be is the final harvest. Until then, we need to be about the harvest. We need to be sowing the seeds of the gospel. We need to be pruning in our ministry. We need to be seeking to see people meet Jesus. I'm happy to report that this year in our church, over 400 people were baptized at Trinity Church. That's amazing. And if Jesus would have come back last year, none of those would have made it. And so God's patience is not because he doesn't love you, but because he also loves them. And he does love you and he does love them. And he's causing fruitfulness in you while he harvests eternity for them. Now, in the meantime, in addition, he gives us a second encouragement to look through our suffering into eternity. And that is that God's judgment is coming. James 5, 9, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. What he's saying is that ultimately when Jesus comes, there will be a harvest and there will be a judgment. The harvest is largely for believers and the judgment is largely for unbelievers. And what he's talking about is this, when the Lord Jesus returns, and I need you to know this, the Lord Jesus is returning. Now, I don't know when, one of the most popular things that sells in the Christian market is something called end times or eschatology. And this is where people get so sick of the planet, they wanna pay someone to tell Jesus to come back quickly. Okay? And the point is we can't change the date of his arrival and we can't predict the date of his arrival. Only he knows when he returns. People always ask me all the time, when is Jesus coming back? I don't know, I don't know. I don't know, I'm, I'm on the planning committee. Nope, I'm on the welcome committee. I don't know when the party is, but I have the kazoos, right? I'm ready to go. <laughs> At the end of the day, what he's saying here is this, something in us longs for judgment. Even if you're a non-Christian, God has made you with a conscience. You know that certain things are right and wrong. And there is a day that we all reach, there is a point that we all arrive at where we can no longer tolerate injustice and evil and oppression and suffering. It's like, I can't handle it anymore. 
And now we have technology and technology only multiplies misery. It used to be that the amount of information that you had access to was very limited. So there was evil, but you didn't know about it. There was injustice and tyranny and oppression. There were lies and fake news and murders and mayhem, and you didn't know about it, but God did. Think of it from God's perspective for a moment. For the first time in global history, we have a bit of a sense of what it must be like to be God. All day, every day, technology feeds us a steady stream of depravity, of debauchery, and the demonic. I don't know about you, how many of you are like, I just can't turn my phone on anymore. Every day is a bad day. Every day is a bad day. Imagine being God. See, you and I, we're not altogether good, he is. When we see evil, it bothers us, but it devastates him. Uh, it says in Genesis 6, we'll get into it next year when we jump into the book of Genesis. It says that God looked at the earth and he saw the inclination of man's heart was only evil continuously all the time. And it grieved God in his heart that he made man. God looked at the planet and was like, that's just a devastating heartbreak. Everyone, everything. See, our God is not indifferent to suffering. Our God is inclined toward hearing the cries of the suffering. Just think of it from God's perspective. And what happens for us, we get so sick of it. We're so tired of it. We're so weary of it. We can no longer endure it. All the evil, all the injustice, all the oppression, all the lies, all the hatred, all the conflict, all the selfishness, all the pride. We just reach a point where it's like, that's it. I'm gonna convene court. I'm gonna render a verdict. Somebody needs to say something. And we all do. And what he says is this, that ultimately Jesus Christ is the judge. Now here's the big idea. Our judgment is never perfect, his always is. Our judgment is often premature and his never is. In addition, rather than looking down on others, spending our time judging them, we should look up to Jesus and prepare ourselves to be judged by him. There is a day of judgment coming for everyone. And there will be one judge for us all. His name is Jesus Christ. Now, let me say this. If you are not a Christian, you are living in the path of the wrath of God. You are your own worst enemy. You are the biggest problem you have. You're not special. You're a sinner like everybody else. You don't have a good reason. Ultimately, you have sinned against a holy, good, and righteous God. You have violated every command that he has laid on your conscience. You have ignored the authority of his word. You are guilty and you stand condemned. And you're either going to be judged by Jesus or Jesus is going to be judged for you. We tend to divide into categories. Are you on the political left or the right? Are you on the economic top or the bottom? Are you on the generational young or the old? And human history really comes down to this. Everyone is marching toward a courtroom where Jesus Christ, seated in authority, judges everyone in human history. You need to be prepared for that day. You need to live for that day. You need to anticipate that day. The most important day of your life is not the day you're born, it's the day you die. And that day determines every single day that you will have for all eternity and every ensuing day. If you're not a Christian, let me explain to you why we love Jesus so much and why you should too. Our God saw the sin and the suffering and he came down as the savior. 
I don't know about you, if I had the option of coming down to the earth or leaving the earth, I would leave the earth. How many of you right now, if God said, would you like to leave? Yes, please, please. Can I, can I go home? If it's half as good as I've read about, it would be amazing. God was in an environment with no suffering. He came into an environment with suffering. He, he was in an environment with no death and he entered into an environment of death. He, he was in an environment of pure peace and he entered into an environment of pure chaos. And Jesus lived the life that you and I have never lived. So our God becomes a man to reconcile men to God. I, this is, I, I, I learned this at age 19 in college. I'm 51 years of age. I've been teaching through books of the Bible for 25 years and my mind still explodes when I think about Jesus. I haven't gotten over just the, the absolute incredible mystery of the humility of Jesus Christ. And he comes down and he doesn't sin, but he does suffer. He does suffer. And he suffers and dies so that you and I could live. Jesus does the most incredible thing. He goes to the cross and he endures the greatest suffering and the greatest injustice in the history of the cosmos. Jesus who has no sin is going to take on all suffering. For some of you who immediately correlate sin and suffering, let Jesus force you to rethink your categories. Just because they're going through a bad time does not necessarily mean that they're a bad person. The best person went through the worst suffering. And Jesus on the cross, he is, he is judged by the political leaders because he declares himself to be God. He is judged by the religious leaders because he declares himself to be God. He is judged by the crowd who chooses a criminal over him for the sparing of life. He is judged by Satan and demons who appoint him to death. And he is judged by God the Father. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You and I need to know that we worship a savior who suffered. And he suffered so that you and I could take his place and that he could take our place. Um, this is one of the reasons I know that human beings didn't write the Bible. Nobody would write the story that we're as bad as we are and he's as good as he is. You're worse than you think and Jesus is better than you can think. What you have done is worse than what you can imagine and what he has done is greater than what you can even fathom. The gospel's good news, it's great news. It's the greatest news that's ever been told. And what happens is this, Jesus took my place and put me in his place. All this happened at the cross of Jesus. The judge allowed himself to be judged. He came off of his throne and he instead went to his cross. He went from being judge of me to being judged for me. I don't deserve this. This is pure grace, friends. It's not like Jesus looked down and said, I can't live without Mark. I'll tell you this, I could live without Mark. <laughs> like, like I drive myself crazy. I can't imagine picking me. And what happened on the cross, he took my death to give me his life. He took my condemnation to give me his salvation. He took my wrath to give me his grace. He took my unrighteousness to give me his righteousness. He went from being my judge to being my savior who was judged for me. And let me say this, if you don't know Jesus, you need to know Jesus. If you've not given your sin to Jesus, you need to give your sin to Jesus. And, and, and let me just say this, because this is all a verbal process. I'm so freaking sick of our world talking about justice without being concerned about God getting his justice. And I'm so sick of everyone being a victim and nobody talking about how we have victimized Jesus Christ. 
And I am so sick of everybody talking about suffering and no one preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the only hope for eternal suffering, which is the worst suffering of all. If you care about suffering, you need to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the only hope for the worst suffering of all. So friends, there are two options. Jesus will be judged for you and he will save you from sin and suffering or you will be judged by Jesus for all of your sin and sentenced for all of your suffering. My job is to tell you the truth. Your job is to make the most important eternal decision you will ever make. And that is, will Jesus be your judge or will he be judged for you? And what, 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 what James is doing here, he's taking the suffering that we feel And he's wanting us to also consider the suffering of his brother and our savior. And it's not that you're not allowed to consider your suffering. You're just not allowed to be selfish enough to consider that you're the only one who suffered. And you need to also be cognizant of the suffering that you have caused the savior. And he wants us to look through our suffering to the harvest. He wants us to look through our suffering to the judgment. And he's trying to extend the horizon of our prophetic imagination so that we can think in the categories that God does. And so then, and let me say this too, there are two things in the Bible. There are indicatives and imperatives. Indicatives are the things that God does that has nothing to do with you. God made the heavens and the earth. You're like, well, what did I do? Nothing. Well, God saved sinners. What do I do? Nothing. Jesus comes back. What do I do? Nothing. God's got some things that he's not inviting you to participate in. 300 times the New Testament tells us about the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's once every 13 verses. God's got a plan. God's got it all figured out. God is according to plan. The imperatives, unlike the indicatives, the indicatives are the things that God does. The imperatives are things that God invites us to do with him. The imperative here is this, patiently suffering. Patiently suffering. And James says it this way, James chapter five, 10 through 12, do what you can do and wait for God to do what only he can do. You do your indicatives and you wait for his imperatives. As an example of suffering and patience. So what does this look like? See, we can read the words of the Bible. We need to look at the lives of the people who wrote those words. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast, consistent. Nobody ever got a medal for going into battle and then retreating halfway through, right? You only get rewarded at the end of the war. You got to make it to the end. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. So two categories of examples, the prophets and Job. And you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, Satan's not and the world isn't, but God is. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you will not fall under condemnation. Let me first look at the warning and then the examples. What he says is when you're suffering, Don't make emotional, short-term, short-sighted promises, oaths, or vows to relieve the pressure because you'll always regret it. He's quoting his big brother, Jesus, who says this in Matthew 5, 34 through 37, do not take an oath at all and let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this is from evil. We are supposed to covenant with God to be patient through our suffering. The counterfeit of that is a vow or an oath, not with God, but with ourself. When you are hurting, when you are broken, when you are traumatized, when you are suffering, when you are abandoned, when you are betrayed, when you are exhausted, when you are oppressed, when you are cursed, you are vulnerable to making what the Bible calls an oath or a vow. Usually it is accompanied with these words, no one 
and never again. No one will do that to me. No one will say that to me. Never again is that going to happen. And usually it's a bitterness, it's a trauma trigger, it's an unhealed hurt, it's a brokenness caused by genuine suffering. And the thought is, this is so painful that I need to make an oath or a vow to protect it. And the oath or the vow will safeguard me from further harm. It's the opposite of faith. You may endure the same suffering repeatedly. Your first spouse may cheat on you and so may your second. Your first child may be a prodigal and so may your third. You may have cancer and it may come back. Your business partner might gut you and so may your new business partner. What happens is once we go through suffering, we don't want it to happen ever again. And we're not the sovereign and we don't control the future, but we want to be because we think that the worst thing that could happen is a reliving of the pain. It's not. The worst thing that can happen is living without the Lord. I would rather live through the pain with the Lord than without the Lord and without the pain. I don't know what you've been through, but here's what I do know. Everybody who's going to heaven goes through hell to get there. That I know. This world is so traumatizing and broken that nobody makes it out alive. It kills all of us. And what happens with these inner vows or oaths, it actually paralyzes you. It doesn't protect you. It, it breaks you. It doesn't burden you. Let me explain these a little bit. We often make vows rashly amidst pain. Oftentimes we make vows at a very young age and we're so familiar with them that they, they're almost unconscious. Sometimes vows become entrenched as generational curses. We have rules and vows. And let me say this too, people that have vows become legalistic and religious. Religion is the opposite of relationship. It was the religious people who murdered Jesus because he was violating their vows. He never violated God's word, but he violated their vows. People who are the most religious are the most broken. People who are the most legalistic are the most traumatized. People who are the most controlling are the most unhealed. And what you're dealing with are their vows. Legalism, tradition, and religion comes out of vows and oaths. It is about control and protection, not about faith and suffering. And sometimes we bind these on our own children. These become generational curses then, where whole generations of the family line live under a vow. I see it all the time with men. I have got a particular heart for and calling for men. And men are told stupid things like, real men don't cry. Okay, then Jesus is not a real man. Because the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. If your daughter never sees tears, you're a terrible dad. Right? If she doesn't see the heart demonstrated in the eyes, you're true to the vow you're not loving to your little girl. Men are told stupid things like, uh, real men don't hug. Jesus does. In fact, he rises from the dead, he hugs a ton of people. And kids come up for hugs. Real men don't say they're sorry. Well, real men are sorry. Real men don't apologize. Mm, real men should. Otherwise you don't set a culture of honesty in your own home. Some of you were raised in 
legalistic homes. Some of them were religious, some of them were irreligious. It was vows, it was oaths, it was broken people, it was traumatized people, it was hurt people, it's suffering people who are so afraid of the pain that they ultimately reject the presence of God. And you know that you've stumbled across someone's vow when they become very emotional. You're getting near an unhealed hurt, a trauma trigger, a pain point. And so some of you, you have relationships and people, we're heading into the holidays. Again, this is all just me thinking out loud. But for some of you, Thanksgiving and Christmas are really hard because you're dealing with everybody's vows and oaths and their triggers and traumas and their pains and their, their brokenness. And you gotta make sure, okay, how do I navigate this? And it, the holidays literally become like navigating through a minefield. You know, my, my dad, when he gets stressed, he drinks too much. And his vow is that he's not gonna deal with anything. He's just gonna get drunk. And then my mom's vow is that she's just gonna spew all of her bitterness and let everybody know what she thinks. And then my brother's vow is that he's gonna make the family love each other and try and make peace. And then my sister's vow is that she's gonna set it all on fire. And oh, happy Thanksgiving. The reason that the holidays are painful is sometimes everybody's vows collide. And as you violate their vow, they get very emotional. And that violates their vow and it gets very emotional. It's a bunch of broken people just breaking each other. What he says is, when you're suffering, you're most vulnerable to vow making, to oath taking, and to relationship breaking. He says, is there any other answer or opportunity he says, number one, consider the prophets. We read the Bible, we read of the prophets. We think, wow, they're like the superheroes of the Bible. They're almost mythical creatures. Like, oh my gosh, Elijah has fire come down from heaven. That's awesome. It's because he needed it. Oh my gosh, a chariot to heaven. That's incredible. Ravens bring you lunch, that's neat, right? The prophets are like the superheroes of the Old Testament. Here's what I want you to know, profoundly human, profoundly human. They weep, they bleed, they struggle, they suffer. They lose, they're patient through suffering. Here's exactly how he says it of the prophets. As an example of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Wow. What a prophet does, God tells them something and then they tell the people. And the people, do not want to hear it and do not like it and do not receive it and do not celebrate it. So the only way to stop hearing it is to destroy the prophet so that he's no longer saying it. Um, this is me. I care about the truth. I don't care about what it does because that's not my responsibility. My job is to tell the truth. God's job is to determine what happens. I don't care about polls. I don't care about outcomes. I don't care about popularity. I don't care about my reputation. I don't care about my health. I don't frankly care about my life. I care about the truth because I believe the truth sets people free. I want you to know that if I am your pastor, you will pay a higher price than attending another church. I know not why, people listen to me. I know not why. I could still remember being in my 20s. 
I'm nobody. I've got a hundred punk rockers meeting late on Sunday night and I'm a volunteer and national public radio calls and says, we need to talk to you. Why? Why do the non-Christians care what I think? Mother Jones calls. I've been on ABC Nightline twice. I got my makeup done between Barbara Walters and Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> Talk about suffering. <laughs> And it is not because I am winsome or enjoyable, amen? <laughs> but because God's word is supernatural and powerful. And when God's word goes forth, it just awakens demons. It elicits the flesh, it saves sinners and it incites war. And the two train tracks happen when God's word is unleashed. The wonderful and the woeful, the blessing and the cursing. People are saved and other people are determined that there is no salvation for you. So he says, look at the prophets. Hebrews tells us this, some were tortured, tortured. Pastor Mark, is that where history is going? Yes. I think evolution is adorable. We're good, we're getting better, yay. We need to drug test you. You're not dealing with reality. We're bad and getting worse. Things are not trending in the direction of faith, freedom and family. That's why many who are supposed to teach God's word are instead editing or apologizing for it. Amen. At the end of the day, it's like, well, they're not gonna like it. Well, the question is, are you gonna offend him or are you gonna offend them? I'm not trying to pick a fight, but if there is a fight, I don't wanna fight him, he's undefeated. <laughs> they were tortured, refusing to accept release. If you just deny him, if you'll disown him, if you'll edit, if you'll water down, you can, you can go free. They did that to James, by the way. He's writing at this point, at the end of his life, history outside of the Bible records that they told him, you deny Jesus and you can live a good life. So they brought him up to the top of the temple, said, deny Jesus, we're gonna throw you down. He wouldn't deny Jesus, they threw him down. He hit the ground, he's all busted and broken, but he's not dead. They come up, they're like, okay, you got a few breaths left, last chance, deny him. He didn't. And you know what? He's been hanging out with Jesus now for 2000 years. James isn't dead, he's alive. James is not dead, he's alive. And when he closed his eyes and he saw his brother and he heard, well done, good and faithful servant, it was worth it. You gotta look through the suffering to the harvest. You gotta look through the suffering to the judgment. You gotta look through your pain and see your savior goes on to say, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawn in two. Let me just say this, evangelicalism has turned into a bunch of evangelical fish. No spiritual vertebrae whatsoever. Pastor offended me, parking was hard, coffee was cold, bad Yelp review. Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, I would say it's asinine, but you shouldn't say that in church, so I won't. <laughs> they were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. I didn't get as many likes as I was hoping. Oh, oh. Of whom the world was not worthy. See, God's heroes are Satan's villains. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Example number two, Job. Job's a book in the Old Testament. It's a long book, one guy, all he's got are bad days. You keep reading, you're like, where's this good day? 
The end. <laughs> it starts that Job is wealthy. He's really done well in business. He's healthy. He's got a family. Uh, he's got 10 kids, seven sons, three daughters. He looks blessed. And then the bottom falls out of his life. His kids die. Worst thing I can conceive of, preaching your own kid's funeral. I can't think of anything worse than that. His kids die. His business goes bankrupt. He loses everything. He's sitting on the ground. His body is broken out with sores. He's got shards of pottery. He, don't, he doesn't know where God is or what God is doing. 37 chapters. Here's Job. God, where are you? Why? What is happening? What, what are we doing? Where is this going? When is this ending? He's very passionate. He's very emotional. He's very truthful. He's got a few people to walk with him. His wife, who comes up and says, why don't you curse God and die? Oh yeah. You know what I need on my worst day? I need to poke God in the eye. That's what I need to do. Thank you, honey, for your gift of discouragement and suicide. Thank you. I'm so glad I married Grace. I mean, I, have, I, I live with my dream girl. My wife is a wife of faith. I mean, she's, she's with me and still smiling. I mean, I mean, I can't imagine going home to Job's wife. All the kids died. Oh, you should die too. Oh gosh, right? All right, one guy needs marriage counseling. Okay, so. <laughs> and then he's got a couple of buddies who are theologians. They're at GCU, they're working on their masters. <laughs> These kids are no help at all. They show up. They're like, okay, we're studying in class that uh, sin causes suffering. If you're suffering, it must be because of sin. Where's your sin? He's like, I don't know, man. I'm not perfect, but I don't know. God already said in Job chapter one that he was righteous and blameless. Sometimes there was a, there was a dumb book written some years ago called when bad things happen to good people. A lot of Christians are like, there's no good people. Well, there's a few and some really bad things happen to them. So the title did have some insight. Like Jesus was good people and bad things happened to him. Job was good people, bad things happened to him. Some of you are good people and bad things are happening to you. Some of you are bad people. Bad things are happening to you. Some of the things in my life, I can't blame anybody. It's self-inflicted gunshot wound. I said or did something, call the police. I've been shot. Who shot you? I shot me. Like, well then go to the hospital. You know, like we don't need to fill out forms for this. Some of us, we've shot ourselves. Some of us have just been shot. And some of us, it's a little bit of both, amen? If we're honest. Job's a guy, didn't shoot himself, he got shot. For 37 chapters, he's trying to figure out, God, why'd you shoot me? And we know something that Job didn't, that our personal relationship with God involves three persons. In addition to God and Job, there was Satan, who came to God and said, the only reason Job blesses you is because you bless him, I bet you, if you stop blessing him, he'll start cursing you. Job has no idea why he's suffering. Sometimes you and I have no idea why we're suffering. And sometimes there's not an answer for the suffering. There's just a God to carry us through the suffering. The whole backdrop for Job is spiritual warfare. Sometimes the worst things happen 
to the most godly people. And if you look at Job, you're like, how did he do it? How did he get up every day and persevere in steadfastness? Your kids are dead. Okay, I'll process and move forward. Your business is burned to the ground. Okay, I'll process and move forward. Your friends are now attacking your character. Okay, I'll process and move forward. Your wife is your worst enemy. Okay, I'll process and move forward. Everybody's talking about the joke that your God is. Okay, I'll process and I'll move forward. How did he do it? You gotta extend your horizon. I'll never forget the first time I read Job. I was a college freshman. I'm sitting in my dorm bed, I'm reading through Job. And I hit Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. I jumped off my dorm room bed. Job is the first written book of the Bible. It's not the oldest history, Genesis is, but it's the oldest writing. Job writes before Moses. See, here we are, you know, the Old Testament promises the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus comes, he lives, he dies, he rises. And then the New Testament promises our resurrection. And here we are, we're right on the precipice. We're peering over the edge of history. We're waiting for the second coming of Jesus. We're waiting for the resurrection of the dead. We've seen so many promises come to pass and prophecies come true. We can bank roll our entire eternity on the fact that God who was faithful will be faithful. Job was at the beginning. He's the first person to write about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's what he says. I know, I need to just anchor your soul in the resurrection of the dead. I've got to drive that stake deep into your soul. If Jesus isn't alive, and if you don't rise, then we have no hope. We have no joy. We have no future. But he is alive. And Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And that in the end, in the end, thousands of years later comes James. Thousands of years later, here we are, still waiting patiently. I know that my Redeemer lives, and one day, I know not what day, but I know one day, he will stand on the earth. Job is looking through the first coming of Jesus to the second coming of Jesus. That's faith and that's patience. Job is peering down the corridor of history by the power of the Holy Spirit saying, eventually Jesus will come and then he'll come again and then it's gonna be all better. I just gotta wait for the second coming. After my skin has been destroyed, He's going he's gonna to see me die before I see him come. Yet in my flesh, I will see God. Job is saying, not only is Jesus coming to rise from the dead, he's coming again to rise me from the dead. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. I can't wait, he says, to look Jesus in the eye. Let me say, everything you've been through will be worth it. Everything you've endured will be in the past and everything you enjoy will be in the future. You will be rewarded for all of the suffering that you go through. Your savior sees and knows all. I'm gonna bring the band up. We're gonna worship this Jesus Christ. We're gonna be steadfast in patience. We're gonna go through what we have to go through to become who he's appointed for us to become. And worship is the time where we wait patiently. Rather than worrying, we're worshiping. Rather than fighting, we are surrendering. Rather than demanding, we are trusting. 
And I just want to give you this hope. He says, for those who are steadfast. Here's the other train track. There's blessing. There's grace, mercy, the presence of God, a clear conscience, fruitful living, joyful character, Christ-like disposition. And he says that there is a purpose. Now you don't see what the purpose is because now you live by faith, not by sight. But everything you're going through has a purpose. I don't know what it is, but I'm so excited when we look Jesus in the eye together and you see what his purpose was for what you're going through right now. And it says he has compassion and mercy. He's been where you are. He knows what you need and he's waiting for you on the other side. I need you to look through your suffering to the resurrection of the dead, the second coming of Jesus Christ. I know that my Redeemer lives right now. And I know that one day his feet will stand upon this earth and my dead body and your dead body will rise from the grave and we're going to see him face to face. My prayer is we all hear. Well done, good and faithful servant.